Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. We've got a great show uh, for you, a lot of timely information. We're going to kick things off with the DC and profession update, talk about the pending government shutdown, and we're also going to talk about the ERC moratorium that the IRS announced, and we've got a lot of resources and information related to that, get into some technical updates, and then we're going to have a great discussion with Alan Colton, one of the leading M&A and succession experts uh, for firms. He's been at this for, for many, many years, decades, and we're going to talk to him about what's currently happening related to firm M&A and also discuss a little bit about some succession strategies. We're also going to have an update on the CPA evolution and pipeline. Uh, so let's now kind of get right into it. I want to welcome uh, two of the first uh, presenters, uh, Lisa Simpson, who you all know. Lisa, great to see you. Thank you. And Melanie Loridson. L Melanie, great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So what we want to first uh, talk about is the fact that we lost a legend uh, this past weekend. Somebody who I've personally known for over 20 years. I know there's people uh, in the town hall community who knew Sid Cass for much, much longer than that. He just did so much in his life. He was a World War II veteran, uh, an account, uh, a, a tax and legal expert. He taught over a million uh, individuals uh, CPE uh, over his lifetime. Just a great educator, a great mentor, and a, and a great friend. Uh, he was someone uh, who cared deeply about everyone he interacted with, just a special, special person. So the AICPA, along with many of you, we really mourn the loss of, of Sid Kess. Huge contributions, both professionally and personally. Uh, he won't be forgotten. So Lisa, Melanie, I know you are both also rather familiar with his impact. It really was a privilege to know him and that he chose the accounting profession for us, you know, for him to make an impact and for us to see as he changed things for us. So he will absolutely be missed. And it really is a loss. And it's such a role model for the value of mentorship, the value of volunteering in the profession and, and the, the value of, of a curious personality and, and the commitment to lifelong learning. I know so many people, are, are sharing their, their personal stories of Mr. Kess on, on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So it, it's really heartwarming to hear the tributes that are being paid to him. Yeah, well said, Lisa. There's a great Accounting Today article with, with a lot of quotes in that, Journal of Accountancy as well, and, and I'm sure a lot in social media. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on from that uh, to this pending government shutdown and here's a picture of the Speaker of the House, McCarthy. It looks like right now things are very, very dark. Um, and it looks like we're headed to a government shutdown, Melanie. I know you've been talking uh, to the advocacy team about this. Um, what's the latest? Yeah, so the government shutdown, it is not just a day by day keeping track of it, it is like minute by minute, things are really changing and they're changing fast. So as of this moment, the question really isn't whether or not there will be a government shutdown, but more of how long it will be. And just reading, you know, the crystal ball of where things are at, we believe there would be one, at least a partial or full shutdown. And I guess the key question uh, for those in the tax world, the question comes down to what does this mean for the IRS and will the IRS shut down? And Rachel two weeks ago gave the update in which the IRS does actually have the funding through the Inflation Reduction Act in order to be able to stay open. But it's not a funding issue. This really comes down to the executive branch. And as of right now, the IRS has not updated the contingency plan, 
if you look at the government websites where all the lapsed appropriation, you know, contingency plans are at, IRS does not have one. And they haven't made a comment about this, no public comments. So it could go either way. It really is to be seen and all the information regarding the IRS, whether it's going to stay open or not, it's all premature. And so the impact on our our members and, and their clients in terms of filing tax returns as they're getting very, very close to the October 15 deadline, any suggestions? So, and that's kind of where it gets even trickier because if you look historically at all the contingency plans that have existed in the past um, for the IRS shutting down, they're all different, Lisa. So <laughs> there really isn't anything I can say towards it. The funding was allocated to them. They can stay open. So it can run the gamut of everything will continue on and be operational or they can have a full shutdown, which I can't imagine given the impacts of the shutdown complements of COVID, but you never know in this environment. Goodness. So something that we will be watching, um, you know, McCarthy, he went, Melanie, he, you and I were talking about it a little while ago. He went through 14 confirmation votes. So he's a right. fighter. Uh, he's he kind of right now is moving a little bit uh, to the right uh, with uh, that, that part of the Republican Party. Um, to be seen if uh, if there'll be some type of compromise or some type of uh, ways to mitigate uh, the, the shutdown. But right now, uh, it looks like there will be a shutdown. And we, we always, if there's some, some type of news update that we want to provide, uh, we will get that out to the, the town hall community. Our next uh, town hall will be October 5th, but we'll be monitoring this. And, and if we do receive updates about any of the important governmental agencies that we know important your clients will get that information to you. So let's um, move on now to the ER, ERCIRS announcement, um, which has been very, very well received uh, by our firms. So Melanie, the announcement came out about a week ago. So tell us a little bit more about what the announcement actually was, why they did it, and, and now what? Okay. So it feels like it's been a whirlwind, but um, this announcement is actually a good thing. And the intention of the IRS really is to send a very strong and unmistakable message to the ERC promoters, mills, whatever you want to call them. And they also are trying to truly protect the small businesses. There's lots of concern. And if you give me a second, I want to paint the picture so you understand where the IRS is with this. Um, the IRS has been receiving feedback from tax professionals for some time now. And I know you, know, you hear it all the time. ERC is a huge concern for our members. And Fortunately, we've been beating the drum for a while, and the IRS is taking this very seriously. And they've become very alarmed at the pace of the number of ERC claims that they're actually receiving. And based on the feedback that they've received from external, internal, and anecdotes that they have, they actually believe that most of the businesses that were affected by COVID who do qualify for those claims have already submitted those claims. So, to give you a little perspective, since June, uh, since I'm sorry, through June of 2023, the IRS has actually received 3.6 million ERC claims. The IRS believes 95% of the latest claims coming in are actually invalid and ineligible. So because of this, the IRS is trying to make a statement. Currently, the IRS has 600,000 claims on hand. Um, again, I have to repeat, they believe most of those claims are not valid. Um, so they also have criminal investigations looking into this. They've already initiated 252 investigations, and the amounts of money associated with those investigations is $2.8 billion. They've also already referred thousands of claims to go to audit. So my point is, Something needs to happen, and they're taking some serious steps in order to try to prevent this. So, so it, really quickly, we've got you're going to talk about some of the the steps that the IRS is doing. How do you think the withdrawal program is is actually going to work, and and maybe get a little bit of insight into what they're proposing? 
Okay, so let me touch base on the moratorium, the withdrawal process, and the settlement and what we know, okay. because they're all a little bit kind of related. So the moratorium, what do we know? We know that effective September 14th, they have stopped reviewing and processing any claims. So anything new coming in, they're not looking at it. So there's no point in submitting right now. They know that they're focusing, or we know that the IRS is focusing on those 600,000 claims that they have. With those claims, they're actually doing a more stringent review process and audit process through them, and they're taking longer time to look at them. So historically, they were saying 90 days to review some of these um, claims. Now it's going to be a minimum of 180 days. And if they've got questions, they're going to go back ahead and reach out to you and ask you for more information. So it could take a lot longer than 180 days if they need more information. Um, the other thing is once the moratorium is lifted and they start taking these claims, the IRS has indicated that there most likely will be a whole new process to apply for these claims. So that will be coming down the pipeline. And just based on the intel that we have, we don't expect to get information as to what this new process will be until maybe around January timeframe which then leads us to the withdrawal process, right? Because the IRS right now is actually really encouraging people to take a look for those people who have submitted a claim, but it has not been processed. And what that really means in other words is you have not received the money. They're really asking you to take a look at the ERC eligibility eligibility chart, which should be an attachment that we have for you that you can download. And they're also saying, talk to a trustworthy tax professional and consider withdrawing the claim if you believe you don't qualify for it. We don't have instructions just yet. We don't know what that process will be, but we do believe it should be coming out within the next week. We also know from talking with the IRS that the withdrawal process is much simpler and much, much easier for everybody involved than it would be to go through a settlement program. Now, the settlement program, again, we don't have the specifics of what that program entails, but we do know it's intended for those who have already received the claim where the claim has been processed. And it is a way to try to avoid penalties and more importantly, future actions by the IRS. So we are expecting instructions on the settlement program to become available in the coming weeks, maybe late fall. And we are keeping good communications with the IRS. So Melanie, so, one, I mean, uh, just um, Lisa, I'm looking at some of the questions coming in, and they don't surprise me at all because you always there are uh, you, there, there's a lot of firms with a lot of concerns around the ERC mills. Uh, yeah. There are firms that are are processing legitimate eligible clients uh, right. for for ERC. So they're saying, what do we tell them? I, I was I just was about to file one. Um, and then there's questions, is, is there, will there be a, a chance that there'll be a, an early retirement of the program? And then there's, give me one last one. There's like the three, if you, if, they, if you're in this, the amended three year period right now, is there going to be an extension there? So there's a lot of questions coming in from the community, the town hall community on, I've got legitimate uh, claims that have been sent in. I've got legitimate ones that I need to send in. Um, I've got concerns there. Okay. With regards to legitimate claims, uh, the IRS has an understanding and we also have an understanding that, a lot of, you know, our members, when they're filing through this, they're going through the steps and looking to see that people qualify and they are legitimate claims. If you already have a legitimate claim in place, there shouldn't be an issue. It will just take longer for you to actually receive the credit right? Because those exist, they rightfully exist, and they rightfully should go through the process. Unfortunately, with all the scams that have been going on, the consequences, it will take longer to go through that process and get the claim, okay? As far as, you know, if you were thinking about uh, filing a claim, what should you do? Well, good thing. The IRS actually gave some advice to taxpayers, and they came up with three different types of scenarios, 
So I'll go ahead and address right now for those who are considering filing an ERC claim. What the IRS has said is to carefully review the ERC program guidelines with a trusted tax professional, right? Um, and they keep mentioning a trusted tax professional because we've worked with the IRS now for years on this issue and they have a clear understanding. We're not the problems, it's the ERC mills. And so they are referring people talk with a trusted tax professional because that's the key, right? right? So for those people, go through the eligibility with the client. And if they should and do rightfully deserve that credit, yes, go ahead and file that claim. You may want to wait until the moratorium is lifted because right now what they're receiving is not being looked at, is not being processed, and most likely will have a new process come January. Right. So I think in a future town, you probably want to move on. We're going to have to that that is so you're great work with the trusted tax professional we've got them on the town hall community here they're yep. saying okay what do i i want information related to that when the should i when the moratorium when's it when that when that ends you know how do i get these in uh, and yes it is law right now one comment that came in it is law so to change it that's a good question we get the irs can't change it on their own this is the law so this would take a legislative action i think to to, to move up the date so I think we've got, Lisa, we've got a good set of questions here now on how do I manage legitimate claims uh, uh, that have not been filed uh, with this moratorium? And secondly, um, you know, ones that have just just been submitted, you know, just making sure that there's there's some processing there. So those are things that we'll have to kind of come come back with. So real quickly. Oh, Lisa, did you want to go? No. Nope. Okay, so for those who currently are waiting for an ERC claim that did submit it, um, again, they're asking uh, people to take a look at eligibility and determine if you should withdraw or not. Um, but if you don't feel that you should withdraw, it's just have a little bit of patience as it goes through that process. Now, the real question becomes for those who have already received the ERC claim, but they now believe that they received it in error that's where it gets a little bit trickier, right? Because the information isn't out and it will be coming out in the coming weeks. Um, again, the IRS has said that if you have a claim with them and you believe it was done in error, but it has not been processed, even if it's under or awaiting audit, you can still withdraw that claim. Again, we don't have the exact instructions for that, um, but for the others, they are looking, the IRS is looking, if it has been processed, at assessing what options there are for people who had to pay those hefty and high contingency fees. So the IRS really is looking at, there's a lot of legal um, aspect of this that are taking a look to try to see how they can help. And one of the questions, Eric, that you touched base on is the statute of limitations. The IRS is cognizant of it, and they're working within the boundaries of what they have right now. It hasn't run out. They have been in communication with Congress. They have been communicating across the board um, for many different things. So they are working, and everybody forethought is to protect the small businesses and to really put a stop to the ERC mills. So a lot of questions still out there, I know, but this is coming down with more information and more will come. Right, so I think that in here on, on resources and what I think probably will come out in the, in I, the pressure will be on making sure that you've got the processes outlined here on the illegitimate uh, claims and what you should do, but on the legitimate claims, and then there's a good question about just the 1031 de deadline here, if that's your, your statute of limit. How do you, how do you, how do they, are they going to give an extension on, on that? So that's probably one that we can, uh, we can follow up on. Right. Um, and one quick thing, and I can't stress enough the importance at looking at our ERC resources library. Um, there's a lot of valuable resources that are unlocked there and there are real time resources. So there is a podcast regarding the moratorium. There's a bunch of other information. And you have a list there in front of you that you can access to help you look through and try to gather more information. And Eric, Melanie's had a busy week because not only do we get good big ERC news, we also got beneficial ownership information, reporting news. And Melanie, we just have a, a few minutes to go through this. 
So what I'm going to suggest is that if you're not familiar with BOI, you click on the link in the slides and, and get Melanie's really good in-depth discussion that we did back in July. So you can, you can catch up by watching that replay. And then let's skip forward and talk about what just happened this week, Melanie. Right. So um, quick thing, most businesses that are registered or were formed um, with a filing to the, through the Secretary of State will need to file, right? So that's 32.6 million firms that are expected to file in the first year. Um, so what has happened is FinCEN has dropped new guidance and really they've just taken the information from the rules and they put together small entity compliance guide and updated FAQs. So there's more information and it's the same information repeated in different formats to try to make it easier to take it in and understand it. But I do have to point some things of clarification and then some points that they did clarify, which would help. So the very first thing I have to say, if you're looking at the small business guide, um, they have a list of exemptions, right? And number 15, it says accounting firms. And if you're looking at the FAQs, they also have that same list. And number 15 is accounting firms. That's a bit misleading. Please do not think accounting firms are exempt. They're not. There is one exemption for accounting firms, and it's so small. It's for those that are registered under Section 102 of SARS-Bain-Oxley. So in other words, if you're registered, registered to do audits for pub audits for public companies, then sure, <laughs> you are exempt, but that's only a handful of firms. So accounting firms, yes, you do need to file. So the other piece of it too, you know, we've talked about the penalties associated with it and the timing of the filings. And one of the things that the small business guide and FAQs touch on has to do with a safe harbor for corrected returns. Now, keep in mind, a corrected return, you have to update within 30 days of becoming aware that there's a mistake in the return. Well, the safe harbor is you've got 90 days from when it's originally filed. But that, what most people aren't realizing is, let's say you filed January 1st, and in June 1st is when you realize that you made a mistake. You know, what the rule says is you've got 30 days from June 1st to file, right? But the safe harbor is in the first 30 days. So come April 1st, you're already accruing penalties on there. So just be careful of inaccuracies. And Finson took a really harsh line with the safe harbor because they believe um, filing an accurate report is part of our obligation, which I think, you know, if you look at tax returns, we get to amend returns. In this case, there's no good faith. There's no reasonable cause. They're taking a really harsh stand on that. So be careful. Um, the other piece of information that uh, we need to touch base on is that they clarified is accountants can be both a beneficial owner and a company applicant. Company applicant is cut and dry. If you filed with the state of secretary or secretary of state, then you're a company applicant. Or if you directed that filing and had your associate file it, then both of you would become company applicants. And you only report that for new business entities. Now, hey, Melanie, yes. I, I, I want to make sure we get to some of your technical yep. updates. So let's wrap this one up quickly and then hit some of your other highlights. Sure. So we can be a beneficial owner if we have substantial control and really advising the firm. So please just be aware of that piece, um, too. And more information will be coming out on that. So do you want to move on to technical updates? Yeah, let's do some technical updates real quick. OK, so disaster relief was announced for Georgia. So those impacted by Hurricane Idalia will now have filing and payment um, extended deadline through February 15th. And the payment is not for taxes owed in April 15th. Those were still due in April 15th. This is for estimated tax payments. Um, and then we also have a great resource that has a link to the IRS website and that has the latest information there. So with Section 174 notice, OK, I have to be very crystal clear. September 8th, a notice came out. It did not fix the current law amortization treatment, and it is still requiring taxpayers to amortize these costs. That has not changed. And our intel that we're receiving is we don't see this happening. 
What the notice did cover is it, it explained how to amortize certain specific research and experimental expenses. It did tell you how to treat those expenses under cost sharing agreements, what constitutes software development, abandoned property, research performed under a contract. It did not fix the current law. And I have to be very clear with that. I think there were some broken hearts when you just said that, Melanie. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that was really harsh. Yeah, um, yeah. Digital assets, just the one thing that you need to know is it was a big milestone that Senate Finance Committee is getting involved in this. You know, digital assets are emerging. We've submitted a comment letter for those challenges that we are facing as this topic continues to emerge. And also with corporate AMT, there was a lot of things. So, um, the IRA Inflation Reduction Act imposed a 15% minimum tax, but they didn't really specify who would apply to and how to do that calculation. This notice has done both, and it also has waived penalties for those who already calculated the corporate AMT and used their own guidance, I guess, because this wasn't out in time. So it will waive those penalties. Thank you. That's that's a lot to cover. And I know we've got so much more we can cover on BOI. I do just want to let everyone know that um, we are working on additional resources and longer conversations about BOI, so more to come on that. And Melanie, thank you so much for, for doing an uh, overview on some of the new things that have just been released. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, well, that was an active session. Uh, we, we lit up the, uh, the lines talking about ERC there. Let's bring Alan Colton on. So uh, this is going to be another fantastic segment. Alan, it's, it's great to have you with us. Eric, thanks for having me. Well, let me just, for those of you who don't know Alan, I think most of you do. He's the CEO of the Colton Consulting Group. He's a nationally recognized speaker and industry analyst, and he really is somebody that firms of all sizes, of all sizes go to when they want to talk about their, you know, what's going on with mergers and acquisitions, selling their firm, looking to buy a firm, and also just talk about succession. So we're going to get into all of that uh, with you, Alan. We can, we can drop uh, the bio slide here and have have this discussion well you know alan we were getting ready uh for today's segment uh you were sharing with me you know, how you were reflecting on what was going on in m in, in in acquisitions and m a activity from 1998 to 2003 and comparing it to the last five years 2018 to 2023 so let's just start there let's just start kind of the the large arc of of M and A, and then and then we'll, we'll we'll dig into some of your you know kind of key insights of what's going on right now. Sure, and thank you, Eric and Lisa. You know, did you ever see the Bill Murray movie Groundhog Day? Uh, yes, it, it's like Groundhog Day. Only I was much younger and uh, weighed less and had more hair. But it was uh, it, it's uh, there was a shift, and the shift then was the consolidators came in. And there was a perception they're giving away free money, which no one ever does. And I think what happened was in 2020, roughly around March, uh, private equity came in. And, and, and at that same time, we were introduced to remote workforce. Uh, over the last couple of years, you know what's happened with the labor market. I think everyone has begun to get, get religion on technology and the investment around it. And then I think just the wants and needs of clients. And... Um, uh, you know, what, what's the old saying? What got you to the dance won't keep you to the dance. So we're in that cycle. I, I think the frenzy of M&A is in full force. Uh, it's interesting because one could argue we've been in somewhat of a recession and you would have thought maybe it would have lightened up, but it really hasn't slowed it down. Uh, I think uh, 2020, 2021, 22, 23, 20, all the way through next year, I think we're going to continue to see lots of deals happening. And, and as you said, this is a, even you were comparing it to this five year period was as, maybe not as busy, but with the last time you saw this type of activity was 20 years ago? It was, it was. And I would say this run was busier with more larger firms. I mean, if you look at uh, firms of 100 million or more, I think mm -hmm. in the last four years, we've had about a dozen of them. And there aren't that many of them to begin with. <laughs> uh, if you look in the top 200, we probably had 
two dozen firms. And, you know, there just seems to be a bigger preponderance of deals, uh, almost to a point where it's not front page news anymore. It's sort of a sidebar, uh, almost like it just happens every single day. I think the big change, Eric, is in the old days, they were strict, uh, they were succession planning oriented. Mm -hmm. Someone had a problem or a group of partners didn't think they had enough next gen talent. And that definitely exists today. But I think you're seeing a new breed of M&A going on. And I would call it not for succession reasons, but for strategic reasons. Well, you put things in three categories. You want to review those three categories that, that, that we discussed earlier? Yeah, when a firm is sort of looking at, at doing a deal. Uh, but you were talking about the lower end, the, you yes. know, a lot of people, the large, yeah. but we don't want to use the, you know, a lot of 1040 returns to the, yeah. in, in, in two other categories. So, so clearly, if you go to the, we'll call it the big stage, the, the top right. 25 firms, uh, every firm is in some type of transformative discussion. You know, the output of that could be do nothing. <laughs> it could be form an ESOP. It could be merge with an equal. It could be go the way of PE. It could be right. merge into a bigger accounting firm who is PE. It could be merge with a bigger firm who's not PE. Uh, and there's probably one or two other options out there. We had one a month ago with a firm that didn't go PE and they didn't go with a big accounting firm. They went with a wealth management firm. And so you've got all of that going on there. The, the interesting thing there is about a half dozen, I'm sorry, a dozen of the 25 largest have tried or looked at it. And the vast majority for various reasons have chosen not to go that way for now. If you go to the other side, the, the smaller firm, you know, 33,000 give or take sole practitioners, 10 million, uh, 10,000 two to three partner firms. Those are the ones I worry about because what I'm seeing more and more is um, those firms are beginning to fall a bit out of favor. I think there's just way, way too many of them, and there's not a enough buyers for them. And um, I think that's going to be a, a challenge. And then in the, the mid-market space, we're seeing more acquirers. And what I mean by that is firms that historically were 5 to $30 million of revenue and really did it the only organic way are today employing what we call the triangle offense. They're growing organically. They're doing M&A, but they're also putting capital towards what we call surgical strikes, going in and lifting individual talent out. Alan, well, I, yeah. I review the, the mergers as they come through press releases and accounting today and IPA, and it looks like a lot of acquisitions are driven by an expansion into a particular geographic market or a niche, a specialty. And then, like you said, they're after a, a specific type of talent. Is that typically what you're seeing as, as driving a lot of the, the deals right now? Great question and comment, Lisa. You know, the, the best merger today, I think if you talk to a top 200 firm, would be a firm with 50 staff and no clients. <laughs> uh, so the M maybe stands for mergers, but the A, I think, means the acquisition of talent. And, and I say that today because firms that probably thought they had a value, getting clients today is not the end all. Uh, growing to get bigger is not the end all. Getting better, which means acquiring talent and firms that have specialized niches that you can take and scale. And we used to never think like that. Uh, bigger was better, but today better is better. And anything we can do to get talent whether that's doing it as a merger, a lift out, or whatever, seems to be winning the day. So I just caught a glimpse of a question that came up from our, our town hall community, and it's, so what's a small practitioner to do? How can that small practitioner get better and work on what their succession plan is going to look like? Is it to make themselves look more attractive to a buyer, or is it to homegrow talent? What's that going to look like? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Lisa, the first asset that an acquirer looks at an acquiree is the age of the players. And if it's a lot of dated goods, the valuation drops immediately. So if you can't be that destination place and get that talent to come in, I think the next best thing you can do is figure out a couple of things and become great at them, whether that's an industry or a service line or both of those things. 
what is it you want to be famous for? I think the firm that's going to really have its challenges is the thing, the firm that tries to be everything to everybody and ends up being sort of nothing to nobody. Specialized knowledge, specialized skill. Why? Because the bigger firm says, hmm, in our world, with our playbook, we could take that and scale it. Uh, there's a real asset to be had. But just to acquire revenue today, quite candidly, the larger firm doesn't want to do that anymore. It's not a game changer. And, and there's only so much time you can spend. So they're going to go to the ones that have something special. I like the way and you say, we, figure out what you want to be famous for. And then Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to follow up because there, there are questions coming in when you're for, on that small firm. What's the revenue multiplier changing, you know, changing factor? If you are, because they, if you're that small, you're a small firm, half a million to two million in revenue, and you're more of a generalist um, versus being a specialist. What what could this do for for your buyout? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Eric, and, and I'm a slow learner, and this took me ten years to figure this out. But, you know, I always get the question, what's the current multiple? Or, or is it a buyer's market? Is it a seller's market? And dumbly, I tried to answer those. And what I've learned today is the sale of an accounting firm is not like buying a house, where the housing industry, the pricing actually moves up and down. What I've learned in two decades is great firms with great people and great clients will always sell at a high multiple. <laughs> Firms whose better days have passed and they don't make much profit and they don't grow and they're not a what we would call a firm with a great culture, guess what? Uh, that's a low multiple. So I've, I've stopped giving out the multiple. I would tell you the placeholder we've used for decades has always been one times revenue. But truth be known, it's sort of a misnomer because in a traditional merger, when you join the other firm, you typically get nothing. You wait, you vest, you turn 65, and then we pay you until you're 75. And if anybody ever took out a calculator and hit the present value number, they'd quickly come to see that that's not a dollar on a dollar. That's like 50 cents on a dollar. Uh, what's disrupted has been the entrance, obviously, of private equity, where there's now cash on the barrel head with capital gain and you know a significant upfront price. Well, let's let's go to the private equity in a second. But before we leave the small firm, you know, question is: Is willing to sell under an earnout enhance the options for a small firm uh, with, with with a buyer, or is that even a criteria? That's a very astute person. Whoever is asking that that question, they should get an extra hour of CPE. Um, <laughs> the, the the answer is: An earnout will win the day all the time because it's a shared risk. And, you know, there will always be deals where if it's a $2 million accounting firm and you're willing to accept 20% of cash collections for five years, uh, you can end up with more than one times revenue if they can take that client base and cross sell additional services into it. It's sort of the old risk reward. Mostly. Well, here, at least, yeah, I mean, at least I'll, I'll, you jump in after this. I'm just going to give one more question because this leads into the PE here. It seems that the multiple used by PE firms buying accounting firms is based on EBITDA. Do you see this, you know, comment on that? Is this a new trend? And then maybe just give us a little bit of an update on, have we hit the peak of PE? What, what, what's going on with the PE market? Okay, so let, let's take the first one. Historically, EBITDA didn't matter. It was a non-issue. What we did is we brought revenue in and they came into the acquirer's world. So if the acquirer's Deferred comp plan was you'll get two to three times your average compensation when you retire over 10 years. That's what it was. What we then had is we had some firms moving away from that and saying, boy, if we could write a check up front, we could differentiate ourselves. And you had what I'll call these hybrid cash players. This is before private equity coming into the market. And for some of them, they won the day because uh, maybe those cash payments went to the older group and the deferred comp went to the younger group. Private equity comes along with an entirely new pricing model. And you know the, the algebraic formula is EBITDA times multiple. And the multiple, if you're, in, if you're tucking into a pre-existing platform and you're okay, is probably a five or six. If you're good, it's maybe a seven. If you're exceptional, it's an eight. And if you're what we call rarefied air, maybe an eight and a half or nine. 
if you're the acquirer going to PE, you know, we've seen them go for as low as nine, as high as 11. I think the wave of the class of 2024 will come in at 12. You know, it's sort of like professional athletes, whoever got the last contract, the agent says, let's see if we can do a bit better. Great firms will always carry a high multiple. Average firms will do okay. Firms who better days have passed, the earnout would be their uh, their best bet. Your, your second question, Eric, I think was, what do we, when we look into the crystal ball, what do we see? I think what we've seen in 2023 has been a slowdown uh, with mm-hmm. private equity. And, you know, I would put that on a couple of basic things. One, one could argue we're in a modest recession, although, as you know, we always seem to do quite well in a recession. Number two is the big one has been the doubling of interest rates. You know, these debt, these deals oftentimes are, uh, you know, scaled with debt. And mm-hmm. when you have to borrow debt at 11 percent versus 5 percent, uh, it, it changes the enterprise value. Um, you know, my personal belief is I think in the first quarter of 2024, rates finally begin to come back down. Private equity, and many of them have said it to me, we're going to re-enter the market. 2023, we're on hold. Uh, I think we'll see another uh, round of PE. And what's interesting is, you know, up till now, it's been pretty much the big stage, the top 25. But we're now starting to see private equity entering with a $40 million firm, a $10 million firm, a $20 million firm, and transformation on. You know, if you sort of go two years out, uh, we're going to have probably 20 different firms private equity owned, and they'll be of all sizes. Uh, this is, yeah. So you know, the, the, the big question, Eric, that always comes up is who's the ultimate buyer? And I'm sure that's probably next on your list. Of- well, we've got a lot. Lisa, did, did you have a... In, I mean, one thing that I know you talked about, these practice continuation agreements, exactly. and another thing that's coming out here is should a bunch of small firms, you know, uh, merge with each other as a strategy? So two, 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 two more questions for you. Let's hit P- PCAs especially because I think those are incredibly important. And Alan, you brought that up as we were having our planning call. Yeah, the, the, the practice continuation agreement, and maybe it's just those I talked to, but I am just shocked at how many smart firms and smart people have this amazing asset. And I'm talking more about the firms in the 500,000 to $4 million, $5 million range. And they're so dependent on one individual, maybe two. And I say to them, you know, God forbid something happens to you. What, what happens to the asset? And they have no plan. And, you know, we, the three of us use terms like, you know, the shoemaker, but get a practice continuation agreement in place, if not for you, at least for your family. <laughs> Let there be, and for your clients and for your people. Let there be an orderly process. You don't want to merge up, that's fine, but at least unlock the value and protect your clients and your people. And we've got some resources on that because it is a, um, you know, it's it's kind of a how do I get started. So in your slide deck, you've got a link to a practice continuation agreement toolkit and some other great resources on just an article in the Journal of Accountancy back in August from our professional liability insurance partners on the importance of that practice continuation agreement. Alan, I really appreciate you bringing that up. It's so important. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. And thank you for everything you, Eric, and the ICPA do uh, in that area. I mean, I've never seen more resources on something uh, if someone chooses to do it. But, you know, as the saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't get him to drink. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Alan, we talked about, I think we've had a lot of good questions coming in here today. We're probably going to look to have a repeating segment about what's happening with, you know, firm succession plans with M&A activity. So we do look forward to having you come back, but let's just maybe just conclude on that, uh, that 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 question about you know small firm roll-ups i mean is that something that you're seeing there there is i mean i'm aware of some of that you know people buying up a group of firms then looking to sell that to a p to a pe shop yeah there's a couple of those going on now in in play um you know the tricky part is you roll firms together and 
if you don't have sort of the foundation firm sort of setting the tone, setting the culture, the one that has all the resources and products and services, you you get a lot bigger, but I don't know if you get be better. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that that can't work, but uh, it's a tough one. It's one of those that sound uh, easier than reality. It's, it reminds me of the version 10 years ago of we're not going to merge up, but we're going to merge with an equal. And two $10 million come, firms come together, and now they got $20 million of the same stuff. Mm -hmm. They get better? I don't think so, but they sure got bigger. Yeah. Well, this has been great. And Lisa, one thing that we do talk a lot about here in the town hall is there's all kinds of opportunity to build out niche services. I mean, in that I know a lot of client accounting services firms, advisory services firms that outsource accounting area. There's been a lot of acquisitions of small firms there. I think that's that's something that you can you can get going with rather fast. And there's many things that you can do probably over a one to three year period to make yourself more attractive. So, Alan, this this was a great discussion. We will have you back. Thanks. And, and actually, we'll, we'll have a very short open forum that you may join us for. So, uh, Lisa, with that, I'll let you uh, move us into the, 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 the talent discussion. Absolutely. Um, and again, you saw a quick flash of the slides. Make sure you download those. And I'm, I'm happy to bring Mike Decker on with us. Mike's joined us in the past. He's the vice president of CPA examination and pipeline. So that includes student engagement, the actual CPA exam itself, um, the pipeline academics. He's got a lot on his plate. <laughs> Really quickly, um, because we were having such a great conversation earlier, let's just move through um, a reminder about the pipeline acceleration plan that the AICPA has been rolling out through the course of the year. There's a link if you're not familiar with it and you want to learn more. But Mike, I thought what we could talk about is some of the, the latest developments. And because we're a little short on time, we're going to skip what's actually going on with college enrollments, because I could get into a 30 minute conversation with you about that. Yep. And let's talk about the National Pipeline Advisory Group. So if you could hit that for us really quickly, and um, if we could just move on over to the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so um, really excited about this. So this is um, a national group that we have formed with volunteers. Uh, Lexi Kessler of Aparel is our chair and is leading the organization. We have um, secured Jen Wilson, who's an independent consultant that is um, helping us in looking at all the research that's been out there. We've got over 20 representatives um, from across the profession uh, working with us. Um, AAA, we've got NASBA, we've got state boards, state societies, we've got firms of all sizes. Um, Mark Taylor, you know, from the AAA, um, academia, diversity group, business and industry. Uh, so what we're really trying to do is we've, we have been meeting for a few months now. We have looked and will continue to look at all the research um, that's out there. We are looking at each phase of the student and candidate and, you know, young members sort of life phases and the hurdles that they're facing and then trying to figure out how to ease those hurdles and what we can do as a profession to uh, attract talent, keep them in the pipeline and secure their passage on to, uh, to CPA. That's a, a great, and I know that we'll keep everyone updated on, on the research that come, comes out of that group and the recommendations. Yep. One of the things that you talked about was making, um, ad addressing some of the hurdles and to that point, that's a great tie in to the recently launched Experience Learn and Earn program. We've got some details outlined for you on the next slide about what that program is really like. And Mike, if you can just give us a super quick refresher on the purpose, the objective, and sure. then the exciting news about who our first partner university is. Yeah, so we're, we're real excited about this. The first partner is Tulane University. And so we're calling it the ELE program. And what it is, is we are targeting those students that have graduated potentially more with 120 credits. They're not interested in a uh, master's program, but they need the 150 credit hours for uh, licensure. So it, 
it's a it's a pilot program. Um, we definitely see this as a recruiting tool for firms of all sizes, where a student can enroll with Tulane. They're supported by the firm, and they'll be able to not only get course credit, but also they'll be working at the same time, you know, at, at a firm. And so they're not only earning, but they're um, they're learning, and they're on their way to secure some experience on their journey to CPA. So. We've priced it competitively, which I think is a good thing for today's candidate. And again, we're hearing positive feedback from firms of all sizes, you know, that, that they can scale. And as Alan mentioned, right, it's a it's a war on talent. And how do we bring talent into the profession? And um, Tulane's working with us on the pricing and we've got an RFP coming out. Um, so we expect to grow this program with other universities. So, again, very excited. And maybe one key point, um, this does not lead to a master's or a, um, you know, a uh, degree of any sort. It, it's more just to support um, the advanced education required for licensure. And I'm going to hit a couple of the questions that have come through while, while you were talking about ELE. Sure. Firms of all sizes are encouraged to participate because we do think this is going to be a great um, tool to help you support candidates and, and get, um, get more people interested in joining your, your firm or your business and, or industry. If you are interested in um, maybe enrolling existing staff or getting new staff into it, just see that email address down at the bottom. You're welcome to reach out and we'll get you more information. And um, a point of clarification, these classes will be online classes. Correct. Yep. So the, the student employee won't be going into a classroom. It'll be online asynchronous. Yeah, that was okay. a requirement. Good point. There's so much great stuff to talk about, but I wanted to take a minute to remind everyone about the upcoming changes to the CPA license model and give you a, a chance to do a quick hit on that. Yeah, real quick. So we're, we're again, real excited about this. The new exam will launch in January of 24. We're ready. Um, NASBA is getting ready. The state boards are getting ready. Prometric will be ready. Uh, we're seeing a lot of candidates rush in this year to sit for the exam in advance of the new exam. So volumes are up, probably going to be up 20% this year, which is okay. Um, we're also seeing some candidates not do so well on BEC. So they will sit, um, you know, for a discipline, whether it's tax compliance and planning, business analysis and reporting or information systems and control, they will have to sit for one of the three optional um, or elective disciplines next year. So um, the other thing is state boards are allowing more time for candidates to finish. If you notice, they have are moving the exam credit rule from 18 months to 30 months. That will help keep candidates in the pipeline. Anyone with credit on January 1st to 24 can now sit um, or ha has that credit extended until June 30th of 25. And NASBA and the state boards are looking at what they're calling a credit restoration initiative, where if you lost credit during the pandemic between 2020 and 2023, uh, you will potentially get all of your exam credits restored. So more on that to come, reach out to your state boards for more information on that. Uh, but again, you're gonna see a lot more candidates come back, um, potentially candidates we lost um, during the pandemic and hopefully um, you know, support them in their journey to CPA. Thank you for that lightning update on a really important set of topics. So, Mike, we'll, we'll have you back in the future and we'll continue to keep our, our community updated on what some of the initiatives are that, that we're taking on and, and how they're progressing. Anytime. And speaking of updates, next town hall, I'm going to be giving you an update on some of the work we're doing around helping firms transform their business models. And we'll have a, a deep dive on a new set of resources that is like this close to being on the website. So um, we'll be talking about an entire toolkit around um, helping right size your client base and some examples of how to do that. So Eric, um, we got through that and hopefully we've got a minute or two for open forum. Here we are. Well, um, I, Lisa, you've just been talking, so I've, I've been looking at our wonderful q and I, I, I have to compliment the town hall community because they really have brought a lot of great insights today to us. 
One thing that a number of questions on was just the practice continuation agreements. Um, a, a few people saying they've never seen one in place. We might even want to have a breakout on this in a, in a future town hall, but is there some additional comments that you or Alan want to provide? Can I, can I, can I? <laughs> we have a, um, a PCPS member who took a, a really interesting approach joining with several other small firms within his geographic area because the concern was that one practitioner couldn't just lift the load of another practitioner if needed. So they worked out an agreement with three to five other groups on how to respond if one of the, the members of this practice continuation agreement had a crisis. I've got a great podcast on that. So I'll track that down and make sure that we get that in the newsletter. And I'd, I'd love to talk about that some more. Alan, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I, you know, uh, it, it resonates when it's very real. I remember a couple of years ago getting a call from a widow uh, where her husband had died unexpectedly and they did have a practice continuation agreement and uh, the estate benefited from it. And, um, you know, just hearing the words in reality of the unexpected happening and it doesn't mean it has to be death. It could be disability. It could be other things that happen. But uh, you spend your whole life building a business. And just like you would advise your clients, you owe it to yourself and your family to protect that asset. Uh, never assume you're invincible forever because you're not. Well, on that, uh, thank you, Alan and Melanie and Michael. We've got a lot of good questions for your segments that we'll, we'll get to you. Um, we clearly will be talking more about ERC and BOI as well as town and future town halls. So thanks for being on uh, today's session. And Lisa and I are going to kind of go through some resources now to close this one out. It was a, a, a great whirlwind of, of really important information. So glad we could talk about such hot topics. It was. It was, it was, it was a power-packed hour, as, as we say sometimes. So here's the summary of what we covered today. Uh, we also, this past week, had an ESG symposium here in New York. We brought some of the leadership uh, of firms, regulators, standard setters together. There's a link here to a summary that Barry uh, Melanson Sukoffi and I did. And there is an, a, a development that's happening in the state of California where they are going to have a, a law that requires uh, companies with over a billion dollars to you know, follow through with a number of ESG uh, reporting requirements. So this is something that we'll share more about in a future town hall, but you can learn about it via that video. And we talked today about the, the talent crunch and what firms can be thinking about. So we've got some resources that we wanted to call your attention to, including some blogs and some upcoming webcasts and podcasts. So take a look at those resources and then we'll be building all of that out in our business model transformation conversations. So that brings us to the conclusion of today's town hall. It was, it was great recognizing Sid Kess at the beginning of this town hall. Um, we look forward to being back with you on October 5th. If there's some breaking news relating to the government shutdown, we will get that out to you um, via our newsletter. And Lisa, as we've done, not for uh, you know, any time recently, you and I, we can always call a special edition of the town hall. Not we sure if we'll be. Yeah, I don't know if we'll have to do that over, over this. Uh, but thanks for being with us today. Thanks for kind of engaging with us on these many different topics. Um, have a good end of the week, and uh, we look forward to being with you again sometime soon. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA-TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.